<laughs> Excellent. Okay, so uh, hopefully now you're getting used to the retreat space and the body is getting used to it, you're sleeping well enough at night. But at night time when you're sleeping in your bed, are there people who uh, snore at night and keep you awake? No, oh, because I still remember that often when you're sleeping at night time and you want to get up early to do some meditation, often it's the case that noise can disturb you. I mean, you, you can't get a good sleep that night. But I always remember what Ajahn Chah taught us. It's not the noise disturbs you, it's you who disturb the noise. And that's again a very powerful saying. And it came to the case that one of the monks at Bodhinyana Monastery said his brother was going to come from Europe to visit him. And can he stay in monastery? And I said, of course, he's always allowed to stay there, but there's no room. All the huts are taken. And he said, it doesn't matter, he can share my hut. And I said, those huts we have in Bodhinyana Monastery, they're just built for one monk. They're three meters by 2.4 meters inside. And he said, well, that's big enough that both of us can sleep there. We grew up together, we're brothers. And I said to him, yes, but what would happen if he starts snoring? It's a small room. He said, I've got that all figured out. If he starts, I'll wait to make sure that I don't get disturbed by his snoring. I'll make sure that I go to sleep first. <laughs> so he has to put up with my snoring. <laughs> That was his plan, <laughs> but <laughs> when he actually went to bed, when his brother went to bed, his brother fell asleep straight away. And as soon as he fell asleep, <laughs> snoring really loudly. And so what could he do? There's no way he could sleep with such noise going on in a very small room. So he remembered what Ajahn Shah said, it's not the noise disturbs you, you disturb the noise. So how can he work with this? So what he did was very innovative. I think he was brought up in Europe, highly educated, so one of his hobbies was music. So he started listening to the rhythm and the tones and the flow of that snoring. And he started imagining that this was a composition from one of the cutting-edge composers in Europe, breaking all traditions of music, breaking everything which everybody had thought music should be. It was innovative. He'd never heard any music like this anywhere. And after a while, he could imagine it to be so groundbreaking that it was beautiful. That's when he fell asleep. That's the last thing he remembered after a good night's sleep in the morning. Instead of seeing the negative uh, perceptions of snoring, he started seeing that as something beautiful. And then, of course, he could fall asleep. So if any of you have difficulty with your companions, you know, on the top bunk or the next door, and they are snoring very much, try and imagine it as cutting-edge music. Music which has never been heard in Penang ever before and you hear it first, challenging all conceptions and perceptions. Can you do that? If you can't do that, wear, wear earplugs. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, the other thing which people do, I know that over in the retreat center in Perth where I teach, 
People always complain about some people banging doors. Because everybody's got their own room, but nevertheless every room's got a door. When people go out, bang, they go back in again, bang. And they say that it's really disturbing because sometimes they want to make themselves a cup of tea or a cup of coffee in the middle of the night. And we say, they don't mind them making a cup of tea or coffee, but it's just when they start stirring it. And it wakes everybody up, just stirring the milk or sugar or something in their tea. So they said, can you please ask people that when they uh, get up at night, if they make a cup of tea, can they please stir it quietly? They even asked me, can we keep the names of the people who shut the doors noisily so we can put them in a special hut, the noisy, <laughs> the noisy meditator's hut? And of course I said no. I said, look, when they bang the door, bang! How long does the sound last for? about a second or two seconds at most. But if you start worrying about it and thinking about it, that noise can echo in your mind all night. And that is the problem. Just you thinking about it and worrying about it and planning it. Who was that? I've got to tell Ajahn Brahm about them. They should know better. And I even remember the story I've often told that even, even burglars can come into your room without making any sound. And you're supposed to be much more virtuous than burglars, I hope. So can't you go into a room without making a noise? Or make a cup of tea or coffee without making any noise? Why can't you do that? What it means is the burglar is mindful, is aware, and really wants to make sure it doesn't make any noise because the burglar could get caught. So at the very least, coming on a retreat, if you lose your job, there's always more employment opportunities. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say that. As a spy. Because you can be so mindful, you can go in and get secret information and come out again afterwards. Is that a good employment? No. Well, okay, I'll tell you. That there, one of the monks in England, you know, he was a little bit younger than me. He had a sister. His sister was, uh, had an office job in London. I would go into London on a train every morning and do the office work and come back again. Sometimes she had to go overseas for some work for her company. And only when she retired was she allowed to say what she really did. What she did. She was working for MI6. Not just in the offices, typing up reports but going to Eastern Europe and to probably to Russia because she had this amazing ability that she could read a report, just read it, and she could remember everything with 100% accuracy. So they never needed to photograph secret documents. They just gave it to her. She read it. And then they put it back so no one was caught. And then she traveled back to London and then she reproduced it for the government over there. Very simple service. So there's many employment opportunities available for you if you come on these meditation retreats. But they're not really such you know, nice uh, opportunities. The best thing is you can become peaceful and you become healthy, and you can become wise. But starting off with the meditation, yesterday, the last couple of days, I taught you how to just be aware of your body, relaxing the body. That's important because when the body is really relaxed and comfortable, it doesn't bother you anymore. And once the body is nice and peaceful, 
as I mentioned, in the question time, and it's an important point, so I'm going to stress it again, that when you want to leave the body and go towards the mind, it is like crossing a river. You know, on one side is the body and all the five senses, on the other side is the realm of the mind, the sixth sense. And it's hard to just to cross that river, which is why that we usually have what I call the stepping stone in the middle of the river, which is the breathing. The breathing starts off as something which you feel, it's a bodily sensation. But as I pointed out, as the mind becomes uh, focused on the breath and the breath starts to become delightful, you may notice, if you're wise, that you aren't feeling the breath in the old way. You're knowing the breath. It's experienced through the mind rather than through the physical touch. For those who want to check me up on this, you can actually see that the first part of the, uh, the breath meditation, they called it a kaya sankara, you know, of the body. And then in the second part, the second four stages of anapanasati, it's called a citta sankara. It's coming from the mind, from that sixth sense. That is why it starts to experience to be beautiful, delightful. The things in the body are not that delightful, but once the mind starts to dominate and the mind starts to experience the breath, then it becomes very beautiful, very refined, and very delightful. And that's exactly what the Buddha said when you experience the breath with Piti Sukha. It was difficult to find good words for this, so when I first started talking and writing articles about this, I used to call it the beautiful breath. But instead of calling it beautiful, because beautiful is just too visual, I think like delightful breath these days, the pleasurable breath. It's not really the breath, it's just the way the mind is perceiving it as delightful. And this, to me, is one of the most important parts of the meditation. The reason I call it important, because once your meditation starts to be delightful, once you enjoy it, then what happens is you just, you want to meditate a lot. And when you're meditating a lot, you don't get tired. It's just too much fun to get tired. How many of you, when you're watching a favorite movie, how many of you get tired when you're watching a movie? I don't know what movies you like, it's a long time since I watch movies. What's your favorite movie? You don't watch movies either? <laughs> well, suppose it's, I don't know, Harry Potter? That's all over now, isn't it? People have seen that too many times. I don't know, but say some favorite movie. Or say it's a, a soccer match. Have you ever seen your husband's watching a soccer match and it's played in the other side of the world? They're watching it in the middle of the night, they should be fast asleep. Do they get tired? Do you see them watching a, a soccer match and their head nodding and almost falling to the floor? Of course not. Why? Because they're enjoying it. It is the joy, the interest which you have overcomes the sloth and torpor. It's fascinating. Even if it's during the middle of the day and it's something boring and you shouldn't feel sleepy, still you do. Have you ever heard Dhamma talks and lectures, be honest, by a boring monk? <laughs> and you sit there and your head is almost down here. <laughs> of course you have. Now, the friend I was talking about a couple of days ago, Bernard, you know, the theoretical physicist professor, you know, sometimes at Cambridge, you know, he had to uh, be the MC of the talks. And sometimes some of these monks, they, were, they knew what they were talking about. They were really good scholars. But sometimes he fell asleep and he was the MC. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so, so the monk would finish. He said, well, what, what? <laughs> so, but if it's interesting, you never fall asleep. That's one of the reasons why. Because I experienced that many times as a lay person listening to boring monks' talks. They knew what they were talking about, but they didn't give it any oomph. They should really have learned how to present talks. Have you noticed the way that I present talks? I don't speak in a monotone. You always like pause, and then sometimes you raise your voice, sometimes you lower your voice. And that way, it keeps people alive <laughs> and interested. And that's important because the same with your meditation. If you always keep things boring, of course you fall asleep. That's one of the reasons why even in breath meditation, you know, how can you make breath meditation more interesting? So I developed what I call, I never read this in any book, I never heard any other teacher uh, teach this, the backwards breath meditation. If you heard me speak, you've heard me do this before, what is the backwards breath meditation? I'll teach you now, now just close your eyes, breathe in and out three times, then open your eyes. After the third breath. Go after the third breath. Please don't forget to count. <laughs> and I guarantee that you started with an in-breath, then an out-breath, that's one. In-out, that's two. In-out, that's three. That's the ordinary breath meditation. Now, close your eyes again. Breathe in and out three times, but start with the out breath. Out, in, out, in, out, in. Surprisingly, that feels totally different. It should be the same. But it feels different. Your perception has changed. And that's what I call the backwards breath meditation. It makes it a little bit more interesting. You're not doing it exactly the same way as you did before. That means you're more aware. And sometimes if that doesn't work to make the breath meditation interesting, I teach Breathing in three times to one out breath. <laughs> because, you know, sometimes if your meditation isn't really getting joyful, sometimes the meditation retreats can be boring. <clears throat> Even the walking meditation, I'm not going to do this, it's embarrassing for me. Even the walking meditation, you go online and you can get a video of me teaching an Australian form of walking meditation in the old Mahindarama temple many years ago. It's called like Australian walking meditation. Yes. So instead of just lifting your left leg, right leg, moving it forward and down, you stand, you put your hands in the kangaroo posture, and you jump. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> now you think this is just playing around and being silly. It's not. It gives you energy. And if you do that here, well, other people are meditating, and they see you, they will start giggling and that will bring them some more energy up in their own meditation or walking meditation. That's its purpose. 
not to do things exactly the same way, time and time and time again, but to have it aware, energized, enjoying what you're doing. So these are little skills to get the energy up, the joy up. Of course, that's only necessary at the beginning stages of meditation. Later on, you're watching the breathing, you don't need to be encouraged at all, it's absolutely joyful. And sometimes you just don't want to stop. That's one of the reasons also that on retreats like this, have you seen the schedule? The schedule is not like going to school, where you have to be here at a certain time, you have to leave at a certain time, you have to go to bed at a certain time, or you have to go and see the principal. I'm the principal. I don't <laughs> want to see you. <laughs> so instead, we have what we call in meditation retreats, the ones which I lead, what we call noble silence. Has that been explained to you yet? Noble silence? The way I teach noble silence is on a retreat there are no bells. No ding, 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 get up, ding, 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 go to bed, ding, 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 go and have some food, ding, 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 finish eating. No bells. In other words, I trust you. You will meditate as long as you need. Sometimes the meditation could be short. Sometimes it can be for hours. Experimenting with this for so many years, you find when there's no bells, many people get up earlier. Because they realize they can go to bed at any time, they can give it a try, they're not sleepy. So they wake up and they come in here really early. Is that possible on this retreat? Are the doors locked at a certain time? So you can come any time of day or night. Excellent. What that means is you can actually meditate here really early if you wish. Late at night, after the talks are finished, you can meditate here till 10, 11, 12 o'clock, whatever. If the meditation is working well, you can just carry on. Imagine if the Buddha and had a retreat center in Bodh Gaya when he became enlightened. 9.30, ding, lights out, he would have never become enlightened. You get much better meditation when you feel trusted. If the meditation is going well, carry on. If the meditation is not going well, take a rest. That's not just kindness. That's like the friendliness to your body and mind. It makes it so you actually do get much longer meditations, deeper meditations, more joy and more insight. And sometimes when you have Nobel silence, some people actually do win the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> Peace, stillness, you're not forced. It's a natural, because I trust the body and mind, it just wants to find peace, wants to find its great joy. It wants to have such strong mindfulness, it can go and see a little clump of bamboo and it's absolutely gorgeous. It's uh, mind becomes, you know, the first meditation I went to, retreat, it was in a boarding house for students during the vacation period. Now many of you, you know, know the reputation of cooks in UK. If you want to have good food, you go to France or Italy or somewhere. You don't go to UK for food. And even worse, the cooks who were employed to make the food for students, they were some of the most incompetent cooks of the whole range of chefs in UK. So when I, this is honest, when I heard we were going to stay in boarding houses and the food was going to be cooked you know, by boarding house cooks, I thought I should take sandwiches or something. This is going to be really hard. 
But to my surprise, and this was kind of shocked me, the food which I ate in those boarding houses was actually delicious. And I thought, I must just have good karma, good luck, to have hit on some rare cooks still employed in boarding houses. Because the food over there was usually, everything was boiled or steamed. The vegetables were steamed until there was no flavor left. Everything was boiled to bits, so you couldn't taste anything, usually. But this time, this time it tasted delicious. Even like a carrot, oh, that was so nice. And I realized afterwards that what was happening, my mindfulness had increased. So the slight remnant of flavor left after all that boiling, I could pick up, I could taste it. It's nothing to do with the cook everything to do with the purity of my mind. And I do know in Penang, you do like food. Many people come to Penang because you've got a good reputation for food. Some of my Singapore disciples came out to do a retreat you know, over in one of the hotels on the, on the north, on the northwest of um, Penang. I forget what the area was, but it was a nice hotel. And then afterwards, they didn't keep eight precepts. They said, look, we can't keep eight precepts, not in Penang. <laughs> <laughs> they had their dinner about seven or eight o'clock. Then I just would give the evening talk, do some meditation. And then they were out again. Where are you going? Hawker stalls. <laughs> I don't know how much they ate. <laughs> But anyhow, you don't need to do that because once your mindfulness gets very strong, the food tastes more delicious than ever before. I hope you experience that. You have to be quiet, silent. When you start eating your food, you can taste everything. And that becomes an amazing experience. The food tastes delicious. You look at the sky this morning, this beautiful blue sky. You can see the stars at night, and they're gorgeous. You can feel the wind, you know, just uh, caressing your face. And as you feel it, oh, this is amazing. You wonder, why can I never feel that before? You're too busy thinking about something else. But once you're meditating, you're aware in this moment, silent. And you're starting to experience is the beauty, the happiness of meditation. And why people actually come on their holidays. I don't know if this is your holiday period. And then people ask you, where did you spend your season's holidays? What did you do? So I went to Penang. Oh, Penang, very nice. Lots of nice food, good beaches. Is that what you did? He said, no. I sat in a room with the air con not fully on, on hard, on, on hard cushions, getting up early in the morning, going to bed late at night, listening to monks give talks. You know what you did? You can do better than that, can't you? Go to a nice hotel, have eight course meals, entertainment. Did you get any entertainment? Yeah, we got lots of entertainment. We had this comedian in a brown robe. <laughs> <laughs> You know, honestly, honestly, the once when I was giving some talks over in Melbourne, after I had finished my talks, this man came up to me. He was a Sri Lankan, but you know, he was not born in Sri Lanka. His parents migrated to uh, Australia, and he was actually born in Australia. And he said, I've been listening to you, Ajahn Brah, and you know, you have a lot of talent in comedy. <laughs> he says, I'm a professional comedian. He went on the TV as a comedian. He was that good. And he said, you can get a job easy <laughs> on TV as a com <laughs> comedian. 
<laughs> and I kind of, kind of liked that. Was a, I took that as a compliment. And I said, no, I'll keep my day job as a monk. I enjoy it more. <laughs> but if anything ever goes wrong, I know I can always get a job on TV as a stand-up comedian. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, just the joy. That's one of the reasons why you could do things like that. The happiness. And where does that joy and happiness come from? It's not something you're born with. It's something you develop through your meditation, through your happiness. You sit down and watch the breath for an hour. Oh, it's gorgeous. You just all this energy which you can share with others. And that joy is vital. Because once you have that joy, you can watch something and your mind doesn't wander at all. I said this simile over in uh, Singapore, it's one of my favorite similes. But the first one of the places I, I said this simile was in South Korea, in the town of Daejeon. When I received this invitation to give the keynote address, at a big conference. And you were thinking, oh, that must be some Buddhist conference, some meditation conference. No, it wasn't a Buddhist conference. It was a keynote address at the annual conference of the World Computer Society. I was giving a keynote address to all these experts, CEOs, professors of computer science. I remember one guy I was chatting to, it was very interesting. He was the head of the European Union Cybersecurity Organization. And of course, he asked me, Ajahn Brahm, I've never heard of you. Who do you work for? <laughs> Is it, uh, not Samsung, yes, it's Samsung. Is it, what are the other one? The computer companies, Dell Computing. You work for Apple? Said, no, I'm just a monk. So what are you doing here? And he was saying, I was invited here because in any conference, when you always hear the same thing from the same people, it gets incredibly boring. <laughs> so I'm here to give you another perspective which you haven't heard before. And I started off with insight practice. What is this? I'm holding up. Yes, what else? 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 When you hold something up because of the way you've been taught at school, you think there's a right answer bottle of water. That's not wrong. It's not right. It's more than that. And as you look longer and longer, and you put aside all of what you've been taught, all of your ideas of what a correct answer is, you keep on looking, then you can see more. You can see more and more and more and more deeply into something. That's what we call insight. It's not being seeing what you think you're supposed to be seeing. It's not like a right answer. You see deeply into something and you find uses which you never thought were possible. <laughs> I've got an itchy back. And this cap over here is like serrated a bit, so it's very nice to actually to Scratch yourself with a bottle. <laughs> that, that is insight which is practical. And so I said, that's what I'm here for, to teach you about innovation and insight, to actually to go further than everything you've been taught, so that your computer companies can get that edge in a very competitive world. And actually, they like that so much 
They gave, I forget how many thousand dollars, they gave it as an honorarium for Buddhist society in Western Australia. It was as uh, they used to say in, in London, where I grew up, it was a nice little earner you know, from the computer uh, societies to the Buddhist monastery saying thank you for teaching them something they hadn't heard before, which could be really useful and helpful for them. So this was actually what we mean by the insight which comes from meditation, where you are still. You can penetrate, you can see something for long periods of time. And it's amazing what you see. So in the meditation, you get to this breath. It becomes delightful breath. It's not what you do. It's what happens. So don't make uh, questions such as, I'm on stage one, how do I get to stage two? Just don't do anything. Stage two will come when it's ready to come to you. You don't, this is not like going to a university and you do this course and that course and that course and this course. I know so many people with so many certificates. Are they wise? It means they've, they've learned and they know how to do exams. But they, do they know the truth and meaning and happiness and energy? So what happens is that we learn in meditation much more and much deeper than anybody in any university knows. And some of that wisdom, when it's actually practiced, other people come and ask you, how do you do that? It works. So anyway, we get this delightful breath. That's fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth stage of meditation. You breathe, you're sitting down there, you can't hardly feel your body. But you're not at all concerned about sort of food or lunch or breakfast or anything. You're happy, content, enjoying this moment really content, you don't want anything in the whole world. Can you imagine what that must feel like? You're sitting here, you don't want anything. I may do this later on in the retreat. It was a guided meditation which I developed when in Singapore, the Buddhist community there had a kindergarten based on Buddhist principles. And it was Waisak. And so the owner of the kindergarten said, Ajahn Brahm, can you come and please teach the kids about the meaning of Waisak? And without asking any questions, I just accepted. So I went there early in the morning, and only then did I realize that these kids were three, four, five years of age. Goodness. How could I teach four noble truths when they hadn't even learned to count to four yet? Yeah? <laughs> But you know, sometimes, honestly, I like to be challenged. And so what can I do now? So it was Waisak, and I had a big Buddha statue there. And I said, well, look, the Buddha, when he was born, that was born on Waisak. And according to the story, when he came out of his mother's womb, he could walk. He walked seven steps. And then he put up his finger, I'm number one in the world. This is my last birth. So I got all the kids, even like three, four-year-olds, they could walk. So I said, well, walk seven steps and put up your finger. Not the middle one, the right way around. <laughs> <laughs> I am the number one in the world. <laughs> they all know what that middle finger means. <laughs> so, so they did that, that was nice and easy. And they said, and also, on ways that, that's when the Buddha sat meditation and became fully enlightened. So you can see the big statue over there, was the Buddha doing samadhi. This is taught, taken to them. The Buddha statue behind me, I, I can't turn around. Is it in samadhi pose? I said, 10 little kids, put your right foot over your left foot, just like in the picture. Right hand over the left hand, thumb slightly touching. These were three, four, five-year-olds. Their body was nice and malleable. They could do that, no trouble. Back straight, chin down, close your eyes. 
And imagine, imagine you're a Buddha, just enlightened. You've got nothing more to do in life. You don't have to do any homework. You don't have to worry about your mummy and daddy. You don't have to worry about food. No one will ever fight you. Your elder brothers and sisters will leave you alone. You're enlightened now. You never have to go to school or kindergarten. You never have to do anything. You're totally free. No burdens, nothing to worry about. No sickness at all. And no one will ever tell you what to do. You're the Buddha, the highest. And you don't have to worry about anything ever again. I get on, I was doing this, the kids understood the emotional feeling, the freedom of enlightenment. Even the three-year-olds, they were sitting there so still. And then when I thought I should go on to something else, I opened my eyes and tried to get them stopped, and they wouldn't stop. And even the teacher said, no, 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 carry on. <laughs> <laughs> Because they were also participating and enjoying it. Feeling what it's like to have nothing to do. Absolutely content. Not lazy, but free. And they got what they call the taste of enlightenment. What must it be like to be fully enlightened? All the worries and concerns which you may have. It just all evaporated away. All worries about the future, about health, about finances, about your relations, totally gone. No worries about health. There's nothing to worry about at all. You're sitting there perfectly content in this moment, not worried about anything. No business to complete. Everything is finished. You're perfectly awake, at peace and happy. Nothing more to develop. You don't have to have any more experience of trying to get a first jhana or a second jhana. That's all been done, it's finished with. Imagine what that must feel like. <laughs> and all the lay people listening to that, they were really getting into it. I had to finish to go off to my lunch. But they said, this evening, we demand you teach that again <laughs> to us. And that was powerful, mostly because it gave you the feeling of what this meditation leads towards. And it's gorgeous. It's like you're out of jail and you don't have all these things which people expect of you, which you have to perform. You don't have to worry about aches and pains or the stress of so many things people want you to do. You're free like a bird. You just fly, oops, fly, <laughs> fly through the air, totally liberated. Ah, that's why when you get tastes of that in your meditation, it's the most joyful thing you could ever do. Yeah, you can get so you can win the lottery. Do they have lotteries in Penang? Yes. Has any of you ever won it? <laughs> you don't win lotteries, you always lose them. Even if you make a lot of money, you still lose. You lose your happiness and peace. You understand that the peace comes from simplicity. People often tell me, Ajahn Brahm, come on, you must have some psychic powers. Let me have a lottery number. We give 10% to your monastery. <laughs> and I say, only 10%. I do all the work. <laughs> You've got to be careful because sometimes these monks, <laughs> I'll tell you another story. <laughs> sometimes they do have powers, even nuns. I don't mind telling the story because this nun is dead now. She can't do anything to me. <laughs> <laughs> do any of you remember the, I think she was German nun, Aya Kema? Have you heard her name? I don't know if you've heard the story about Aya Kema. 
but she was teaching a meditation retreat over in UK. When she finished the retreat, she had to go from the retreat centre to Heathrow to get a plane, I think, to go to Austria, where her main temple was. So she was with a driver, and on the way they had to stop to get some lunch. And so it's hard to find a place open in the morning before noon to get lunch. But they found this place, and it was next to a British pub. So it was okay because they just had to go into the pub in the entrance and then turn left and go through the doors into the restaurant area. So that's what they did. And they had a nice lunch. And the driver, who I knew very well, the lady driver, she had a few English coins left. You know, like I think one pound or two pound coins. And it was not enough to get them changed in the, the currency exchange place. So she thought, I've got to get rid of them. And at the entrance, in the pub, there was one of these slot machines. You put one pound in and you pull the lever and all these numbers go past. And she was only doing that to get rid of the coins. And she'd done it a couple of times, she had only about one or two coins left. And that was the point where Ayakema came out. And she, this uh, driver said to Ayakema, you've got much more good karma than I have, you pull the handle. <laughs> <laughs> and in a moment of mindlessness, she wasn't really mindful, no one's not supposed to do that, Ayakema did pull the handle. Please never ask me to do that, please never. <laughs> I will say no. I remember the story, what happened next. And this is true. I, I do make up some stories, but when they're true, and I check them out, this is true. She pulled the handle, you know, mindlessly, and just went round and round, the jackpot. <laughs> and all this money poured out of the machine onto her robes. <laughs> That was bad enough, but then everyone in the pub, English pub, they went quiet. This was something which was amazing. The jackpot had been won by this bald-headed, strangely dressed woman. And then the bartender rang the bell and announced to them that according to the tradition, you know how English people love traditions, According to the tradition, which cannot be bent or amended, anyone who wins the jackpot has to buy a free drink to everybody in the bar. <laughs> so a very, a very good Buddhist nun who keeps her precepts had to buy gin and tonics, whiskies, beers, <laughs> <laughs> to all these people in the pub. <laughs> Those dangerous <laughs> to do gambling, even if you win, you get into big trouble. <laughs> so anyhow, it's joyful that you can tell stories and laugh at yourself when you make a mistake. It's not a big mistake. But so anyhow, that's you know how you feel much more than winning money. This is like winning peace, and the secret of peace and content. How much do you need to be enlightened? You just totally let go. I don't need anything in the whole world. I don't want anything. And then the peace really comes up, which means even in your meditation, you're watching the breathing, the breathing becomes gorgeous, not because you want it to be gorgeous, because you don't want anything at all in the whole world. That lack of wanting gives the energy to your mindfulness. And I've often tried to coin words, this is not in the suttas, even the Buddha never mentioned this. But you have powerful mindfulness, super power mindfulness, super duper power mindfulness. Super duper power mindfulness, you can look at something. Wow. 
all the different colors of pink and red and cream on my hand and all the thousands of lines on my hand. When you're very mindful, you can see so much more. It becomes fascinating, interesting, delightful. And then you can see the most important parts. You know, that you don't own anything. You don't own your breath. You don't own your joy. It comes up when you let it go. It's a powerful insight. And you realize every time you try to do something, try to get something, try to win something, try to possess something, it always creates suffering. When you try and let things go to liberate, to free, to detach, not to pick things up. One gets so light, light in the head, so there's no burdens in your mind, light in the heart, you're light-hearted. People can't make you angry. It's weird. Sometimes when people try and stir you up, they try and make you upset, when people try to do that, I find it's just hilarious. It's funny what people say. Ajahn Brahm, you're nothing better than a dog. <laughs> <laughs> now what Ajahn Chah told me, if anyone calls you a dog, what should you do? Look at your bottom. See if you have a tail. If you know, haven't got a tail, you're not a dog. End of problem. All that wisdom was always funny to me. It's enjoyable. Instead of getting upset what people say, you just have a good laugh. And that wisdom keeps you happy and free from any criticism or any blame. If somebody blames me, Ajahn Brahm, why do you talk like that for? Not my fault. I always like passing the buck. Who do I pass the buck to? Well, that's how Ajahn Chah taught me. His fault. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get proud, because if people say, that's a wonderful talk, your meditation is so great, I say, no, it's not my fault. Ajahn Chah, that's what he taught me. When they try and blame Ajahn Chah, they can't do that now, he's dead. <laughs> but if they try and blame him, so was his teacher taught him. It all goes back to the Buddha. It's his fault. <laughs> his praise. Well, you know, can you take it further? Of course. The Buddha's teacher. That was Venerable Kasapa, the previous Buddha. It all goes down, round, round, round. And you've got no one to praise, no one to blame. And then you're free. So when you're meditating, you get this great joy. You're watching the breath and it becomes delightful. Breathing in, oh. This is Ajahn Ganha. He's still alive. Many of you have heard of him. He's well worth visiting. When he would give talks on meditation, there were brilliant meditation instructions. But all he'd ever teach was, when you're breathing in, breathe in, so Does anyone know what that word, the Thai word, Sabai means? It means nice and easy and joyful and cool and chilled out and wonderful and gorgeous and relaxed and peaceful and beautiful. All those words. So And when you breathe out, breathe out, so Breathe in, so Breathe out, so That's all. When you ask many other questions, I've taught it already, that's all you need to do. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. So, breathe in the happiest, most joyful breath you've ever breathed in in your whole life. And then breathe out this joyful, happy breath. That's all. You get so much 
energy and happiness and joy in your mind. You carry on like that, easy. The only thing which changes, the joy gets more intense, more happy, until the joy takes over. And that's when you see these beautiful nimittas. If you do see a nimitta, there's lights in the mind, please experience that light. Sabha. Don't make it another thing to attain or possess or to develop. Just enjoy. Breathe in. Sub, so watch a nimitta sabha. Watch the nimitta. Actually, it doesn't go in or go out. Watch it develop sabha. When you have that attitude to what you're doing, those lights in the mind become gorgeous. The two things about the nimittas you're supposed to develop. This is, oops, it's come off again. The two things about the nimittas you are supposed to develop. There we go. There we go. What you're supposed to develop are uh, its brilliance, its power, and its stillness. <coughs> So usually the nimbata, when it first comes up, you know, it's a little bit um, frightening for some of you. So they have this word sampasadana, jitang, which means like having confidence in it. You don't doubt it, you don't think it's dangerous, you don't try and control it. You allow it to become very bright and stable and also to still that nimitta, samadaham citta. When it becomes very still, very beautiful and gorgeous, that's when it just, that takes over. At that time you can't be aware of your breathing. The nimitta is just too strong. You're just blissing out. And the next stage is, is when you Mochi Yang Chitang. And that means you enter the jhana through those beautiful lights. You get sucked in. You feel yourself falling into that light. Or well, that light just envelops you. And then you have some of the most wonderful experiences of your life. The jhanas. You're experiencing your mind in purity. And please don't ever think Oh, if I experience those jhanas, then when I die, I'll go to the jhana realm and I'll never get enlightened because the jhana realms last for eons. Please, don't get sucked into those false teachings. Even the Buddha recommended jhanas. The Buddha taught jhanas. When Ananda was asked after the Buddha passed away, what type of meditation did the Buddha teach? This is in the Gopaka Moggallana Sutta. The, the Ananda replied, the Buddha only taught four types of meditation. You know the four types of meditation the Buddha taught? First jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. That's the only ones he recommended. Vipassana, Samatha, just jhanas. Because after the jhanas, you have to be like really dumb not to get insight afterwards. It's like you have the truth right in front of you. You have a, your mind really clear. Of course you're going to understand what this is all about. But the thing is you need the data and the power of the mind. And that's provided by the jhanas. So this is a beauty of meditation. And if you really get into it, you get into a jhana, honestly, you come up and say, thank you, Ajahn Brahma. Thank you for all the teachers who have cleared the way so you can experience these amazing states. And also, just one last piece, because I get, I get fired up by talking about jhanas. And one reason is, because what do you experience when you experience jhanas? <coughs> the way the Buddha described it, he says, 
He described the happiness, the bliss you experience in many terms. My favorite term, he said, what you're experiencing is what he calls Sambodhi Sukha. When I first read that, that can't be true. Because Sambodhi means enlightenment. Sambodhi Sukha means the happiness of enlightenment. When you just get a first journey, you're not enlightened. You get your first taste of what it's like to be enlightened. Sambodhi Sukha. And that always gives me the goosebumps. When you have an Ajana experience, now you get some understanding of what we're doing this for. Why people like me, I'm not becoming a monk to run away. I had a good education. I was fit. I was healthy. When I became a monk 49 years ago, I was even handsome. No longer. <laughs> Why did you become a monk for? Oh, you taste some Sambodhi Sukha and there's no other choice. You go for the most beautiful, wonderful experiences available to human beings with all the wisdom attached to it. So I just, I get passionate about jhanas, dispassionate towards everything else. Okay, I think I've talked too much, as usual. So sorry if I bored you, but hopefully I inspired you with my dedication to this meditation path. I will talk more about the nimittas and the jhanas in the next talk. But this is enough for now. Thank you for listening. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu! Oops. <laughs>